Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being here, man. Absolutely. It is so, so, so good to have you. Um, I, I've heard it said, sometimes before you can take a stand, you got to take a seat yeah. so you can understand. Yeah. And so thank you for being here to help us yeah. just understand. I yeah. so appreciate that. You're a bridge builder. It's one of my favorite things about you. Yeah. Um, you have a heart for unity. And one of the the pillars of Red Rocks Church is unity. That's what we're yeah. about is breaking down barriers and building bridges with the gospel. And mm-hmm. I love that word unity. I, I think everybody probably loves that word unity. It's a beautiful word right. on the surface until you kind of start peeling the layers back and, get, and, and you start getting honest about what unity costs right. and what it takes and the humility required and the, the willingness to say, hey, I was wrong or the willingness right. to apologize or the courage to run into conflict instead of avoiding it. Right. Unity is messy in the process. Um, and so we preach all the time unity, but I, I think this is a season where we are all having to get honest about what unity takes, right? right. At the church, we talk all the time about the presence of diversity, and we love that, but we are slow to acknowledge the presence of disparity mm-hmm. when it comes to race mm. and what unity takes and the cost for that. And so, um, man, I, I'm just grateful that you're here to just help us understand, and yeah. you're so good at that. And I wanted to, I wanted to ask you two questions really quick, okay. and you can just <clears throat> run with these. Sure. Um, the first one is, do I call you my black friend or my African-American friend? Yes. All right? Uh Because I've always wondered that, and I know there's a lot of people wondering this. Yeah, I get that question all the time. And then number two, would you just just maybe share an experience or two about racism in your life? Yeah. Uh, Because we all know the, the statistics, and statistics inform you, but stories transform. Sure. They make it personal. Yeah. So would you make it a little more personal? Yeah. For us? So, uh, your first question, I get that question almost every day, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, because people are trying to have these, this conversation. They, they don't even know the right vocabulary. They're like, hey, do black, I mean, at, ooh, uh, I, I, color, oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, I, I always encourage people to give the most honor to their heritage and go with African American. Let them uh, correct you. If they want, some people go, no, 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 call me black. I'm like, okay, hey, we'll call you black. But I think, I think African American, or even sometimes when uh, I'm speaking, I'll, I'll start with Caucasian and work my way to white people. Because coming out the gates, white people is a little like, whoa, 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 who, who's this guy? You know. So I like to, to, to try and honor people um, as best as I possibly can. Uh, as far as, as my own personal uh, journey with, with racism. Uh, I have experienced more ignorance than I have blatant racism. Um, and I think we all have a little bit different of a definition of racism. Um, my definition of racism is malice towards another race. Like, I despise you. There is some hatred there. Uh, in my journey, I've experienced very little racism. I experience ignorance probably every day <laughs> on some level where a person is unintentionally offending me for the color of my skin. So uh, the racism I experienced, uh, me and my brother, we, in 2011, uh, we were at a Lakers game in Los Angeles, and we were just going up the coast, wanted to see the beach, and this cop just kept circling, just kept, like, looking at us. Uh, we had rented a drop-top Mustang. We're like, we're in Cali. We're going to do this right. We're going to do this right. And so we've got the top down, and he just he just starts to follow us. And it was, like, super, like, weird. And so, you know, even when, like, you see a police officer behind you, you want to change lanes so he can go past you. You're like, hey, yeah. I ain't doing nothing. I'm going to speed limit. And so he pulls up to the side of us, and he says, what are you guys up to? I was like, we're driving <laughs> in America. You know, we got on, like, Lakers jerseys. Like, it's not uncommon for black people to go to a Lakers game in Los Angeles. And he said, well, there's two people that fit your description that have been, it's been reported that they've been stealing TVs in this area. And me and my brother, we like look in the back seat, like where would we put them? We're in a drop top Mustang. Like what? And it was like, I thought my brother was going to go to jail. He was, he was furious. I didn't even fully understand uh, the reputation that LAPD had 
for racism until the OJ documentary came out. And I was like, oh, and I started like kind of reading up on the Rodney Kings. I was really young when all that stuff happened. And it was on the news, but I didn't understand the racial significance of it. Um, but on a daily basis, there's more of the how black are you? Like you're really black if you listen to gangster rap music. You're really black if you, and people fill in the blank on that. So, I mean, I've been told my whole life, you're not really black. You're black on the outside. You're white on the inside. So somehow diminishing who I am can't be black because of, albeit the way that I dress or the way that I talk or the way that I carry myself or who I hang out with. And so that that's, that's really always been a part of my journey. I've always been uh, the minority as a kid. Um, I was privileged to be able to go to a private school with mostly white people. And, and so I've, I've always been a minority and I've always felt that, but I've never, I've never felt imprisoned by it. And what I mean by that is um, it's, a, it's a harsh reality. It is the world that we live in. Um, but I, I, I don't let that make me lose sleep at night. Like, I love being black. Like, <laughs> I wake up black every day, and <laughs> and I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I mean, like, I just yeah. like this. Just it's just it's just my mindset. I'm like, God made me this way, um, and I'm I'm grateful to God every single day for every day that He gives me and the opportunities that I have to to help as many people um, before I die. And so that 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 that's my goal. So yeah. um, it's also weird now raising mixed children. And like teaching them about the world because I'm like I don't even know what you are. How can I explain to somebody else? Because my wife's like one fourth Mexican, three fourths Puerto Rican. I did my ancestry DNA. I got a little Irish in me. I was upset. I'm not gonna lie. I was upset about that. <laughs> and so it's like, how do you explain to these children the way that the world is? Um, my son's class is is it's it's a it's a free for all. There's not a majority anything. His birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. I'm telling you, the the United Nations showed up, and I was like, <laughs> I don't know where he, she, I don't even know what my son. Like, it was just, I don't know if we got the right food. I don't know. I don't know. Like, is pizza okay for every? Like, I didn't. I did not. I didn't understand what was going. I'm like, it was so diverse that when I'm trying to have like a black and white conversation with him, he's like, what What are you talking about? Because uh, statistically now, under the age of 18 in America, it's only 50% white, which means the future that you and I have that we will lead is going to be more diverse, whether we want it to be that way or not. That's so cool. So. I love that. Yeah, the elementary school that's right by our house, yeah. we drive by it all the time, and it is so diverse on the playground. So much more so than what I grew up in, and I'm so excited right. for my little guy, Will, to go to school there. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I used to think Chuck E. Cheese is what heaven will be like. And I guess it actually is because of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Every, every okay. tribe. Let's oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, okay, so when I was growing up, uh, speaking of L.A., we grew up um, close to L.A., big basketball fans. My childhood best friend was African-American. His name was James Walker. And I yeah. have a very, very vivid memory of being at recess on the playground, and James, at the age of 11, confided in me and said one of the teachers hmm. he was afraid of wow. because the teacher was giving him scary looks and said some stuff to him. Hmm. And in my 11-year-old innocent ignorance, I told him it was in his head. And I said, I, I really wow. did. I, I said that to James. Hmm. And I said, I, I remember this so vividly down to what we were wearing. I had my number five Jalen Rose Pacers jersey on, on, and he was wearing his, uh, his yellow number eight Kobe jersey because Come this on. was Kobe's rookie year. He got that for his birthday, Represent. so excited. And uh, I see, and I told him, I said, bro, that's history books, man. Mm -hmm. That is, remember the Titans, that's stuff from movies, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, 20 years later, I'm less ignorant mm -hmm. than I was then. And I know James's experience on the playground was different than mine. Yes. I had no idea. And now I know every other playground, quote unquote, that me and him have been on, yeah. since then, our experiences have been different. 
yep. just like recess. And that's not my fault. That's not his fault. Right. It is his fight, and it's now mine right. also. And the privilege that I have using it is a privilege. Right. Um, but I know you, you explain that concept of white privilege very well. And so sure. can you just unpack that yeah. for us a little bit? Well, I, I, you know, I think racism is a very real thing. And I, I don't think people understand, even my experiences that I've not had, I truly believe, people crack up when I tell them this theory. I actually have this theory that um, I've gotten pulled over, I don't know, let's say since I got my license in, I don't know, what, 2002. Now, I've been pulled over probably 15 times. I've never been afraid. Personally, I've never been afraid, but I've also worn glasses my whole life. And so you think about it. You don't see uh, a lot of these police brutality with people with glasses. <laughs> you just don't. And, and wow. it's like, it's a yeah. weird thing, but like glasses really are pretty disarmed. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's really like, like you ever see somebody that's like a thug with glasses? Like you just don't, you don't <laughs> see that. Like it's not threatening. Like what are you going to do? Like, ah, oh, shoot. Like there's not, there's, there's not. Right. And so like my brother was, was going on a road trip the other day and I was like, Hey man, make sure you wear your glasses. Yeah. He was like, what are you talking about? I said, dude, you look a little rough right now and I don't want to have to go to your funeral. You need to wear your glasses. And so it, it's amazing. Like people's perception of you based off of, off of how you look. So if, if I show up to an interview and a white guy shows up to an interview there's going to be um, some level of, of judgment that just happens in somebody's mind. If, if an employer's looking at two resumes and they see one, one says Jamal and another one says Jeremy, there's going to be some implicit bias that can go through a person's mind about who, who they are. And so um, the idea, uh, how I like to explain uh, white privilege is, is not using the word privilege. I think privilege puts put someone on the defense. Yeah. Um, I like to explain it uh, with the word access. So the word access is important to know that I've been given a lot of access from tremendous white people my entire life. Um, I was able, to, my parents did everything they could to put me and my brother uh, in a private education when they couldn't afford to do so. Um, a, a ninth grade teacher said, we don't want your boys to go. Me and, me and my husband, we will cover their tuition for the next couple of years. And uh, for the rest of my uh, high school and middle school education, someone paid for me to, to have access um, to be in that school. And the people I was able to meet in that are people like uh, pastor of Red Rocks Church, Sean Johnson, was uh, an intern for the church connected to that school that... Uh, I was there when him and his wife were, were hooking up. She was my sixth grade teacher, you know, which I just thought was just hilarious. Um, we're going to make a post of just you saying that. Yeah, for, you for should. Social media. No, that, yeah, that, that's like important that. because when, when Sean slipped in, slid, slid in her DM in, in, in two, that way, what year was that? That had to be 19, that would have been 98. Yeah, 98, okay. Sean, he, he walked into to the sixth grade classroom Jill made up some some reason for him to be there, which there was no reason for him to interrupt children getting their education, but whatever. And so we're all just like looking at the, the two of them, and I'm like, they're going to get married, and they did. And I remember even saying out loud, Miss Jindra, who is that? She's like, oh, nobody. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so anyways, um, I, I, was, I was given access to be in a private education, which most people of color don't, aren't privileged to have. Sure. Um, I was also able to meet Chad Brugman because of that. Mm -hmm. um, Chad Brugman introduced us, for crying out loud. I'm sitting on the stage because someone gave me access. Uh, there was a family uh, that would, uh, ha they had a party one day. Uh, their daughter had a, had a party and she was, in, she was in my class. And at the party, I started hanging out with the mom. And she was like, I just love Ryan, he's great. And so she started telling her daughter, hey, invite Ryan over to the house for dinner anytime. And I was like, yo, I'm hungry. And they had good food on the east side of Rockford. You know, I was like, I was on the west side of Rockford. I'm like, yes, I want to go to their house because they had the good food. So when I got there, I learned that uh, the husband, the father, he was a senator of, of Illinois. He owned a business. And he began to teach me things about business and money and different things that I had never had the access to even know. So, someone was 
giving me an inside look to be a better person, to have a better future. And so what I encourage people to do is, is to look at what access have they been given in their own life and leverage that for somebody that doesn't have any. There are plenty of African Americans who can communicate as well, or if not way better than I can. The difference between me and them is just access. And so there is a phrase that goes around that your gift will make room for you, but honestly, I think it's people that make room for you. Mm. And uh, when I think about the amount of people who have given me an opportunity that I did not deserve um, and gave me a chance, what they didn't do was just give me a chance to succeed. They gave me a chance to fail enough times to get better at my craft, and they consistently gave me opportunities that a lot of people don't get. And so what I encourage people to do is leverage your access. If you're in a boardroom with somebody and their voice is constantly not being heard or they're being overlooked or they're not valued, if you've been given an opportunity to have influence in that room, pause every now and then and say, hey, you, what do you think? What's your idea? How can we, we should listen to them? Because that, that's what it means to use your privilege, to leverage that to help someone else. And I don't even think that that's a, that's a white thing to do. I think that's the Christian thing to do. So even me as a person that has resources and access, I'm constantly looking for opportunities to leverage that for somebody else. Man, that's good. Okay, I'm going to change gears just yeah. a little bit and uh, talk about the season that we find ourselves in right now right. as a nation, as a world. Yeah. Um, because something, it seems, pretty obvious has, has like woken up. Right. Um, and I'll explain it this way. Uh, December 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat right. to that white man on the bus. And that was a catalyst right. for something awesome. And something like, it was like messy to get to unity. Right. Um, and G George Floyd's death, mm. so brutal and horrific and unjust. And correct me if I'm wrong, but his body, I feel like it got put into the ground and the earth started like groaning. Mm. Like something woke up. Mm. So much so. I, I remember you guys have probably seen the, the footage of his little girl mm. in the presence of a million peaceful protesters screaming, my daddy changed the world. Wow. Changed the world. And mm. I want to say, yeah, he really did. Mm. Something is happening right now yeah um and and you told me yesterday on the phone and yep. i want to uh, there's so many questions around this i want to ask sure. you but the first one is you said there's a difference between responding to a crisis right and responding to a conviction yes so can you unpack that really quick before i ask you the next question yeah so right now diversity talking about racism is trendy which almost makes it safe to talk about uh, you take a person like my brother who talks about racism all the time and takes licks on Facebook and social media for being like, dude, why are you coming at us? But he was screaming from the rooftops before there was a crisis, before it was trendy. Mm -hmm. Now people are like, oh, okay, man, let, let's, let's have Corey talk about this thing. And Corey's going, I've been trying to tell you this for years. And so whenever it's trendy, we can fall into this trap of going, well, what do I say? Man, what, I, I just, what do I post? I, I, okay, uh, black people are like, use your voice. All right, cool. So let me, let me Google a Martin Luther King Jr. quote and put it on Twitter. Hey, I said something. And it's like, okay. And then sometimes you say something and it's like you didn't say it the right way. And then you, yeah. you almost feel like you can't win. And then what you're then doing is you're playing almost a politics game trying to be politically correct. And so sometimes we're looking for the right thing to say um, instead of uh, thinking about the right thing to do. And so I think we can't um, just respond to a crisis. I think there has to be a true conviction of our hearts to say, not, Lord, help me say the right thing, but, Lord, help me think the right way. If, would you change some things in my heart? Um, when Ahmaud Arbery uh, video went, went viral, it was like May 6th, May 7th, um, I started running every day in May. 
for God knows why. I don't know. I just started doing that. <laughs> and then people started thinking I was actually a runner. They're like sending me stores to go to and like, oh, you should get these shoes. I said, guys, it's just in May. I'm going back to basketball June 1st. Trust me. People are like, come on, let's run a 10K together. I go, let's not do that. Okay. So, <laughs> but people started going, man, this is a, this is a black man running in his neighborhood. And on May 8th, my best friend from Minneapolis called me three times, and I was like, oh, my gosh, it must be an emergency. So I was like, hey, man, what's up? I'm in the middle of something. And he was like, in tears, in tears. He said, I never thought I would be afraid for my best friend to just go running in his neighborhood. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? He's like, no, 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 like, I'm, my, my heart is broken for you. Like, are you sure you're going to be safe today? Mm -hmm. And... Here's what I thought about that. It was an authentic response. It was an authentic, something's wrong, and I need to check on my friend. Not, hey, so I called my black friend today who's running a lot, and, and he said he's good. Like, this isn't, we're not doing photo ops. We're, either we care or we don't. I, I actually would rather you not care at all than to pretend to care on social media because it's trending. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I think there should be a true, like, something's wrong. I want to do something about it. And I don't always know what to say, but I don't want to go to social media first. I want to go to somebody in my world before, before, before I ever get there. Because, and again, it's just a hard thing. I, I believe there are plenty of sincere people that are posting out of the sincerity of their heart. Sure. But when it's trending and there is this social pressure and you see so many companies caving. They go, well, we got to say something. And so you can actually say something and remain quietly racist or quietly biased or quietly ignorant and change nothing about you. You just hired a PR firm. And sometimes your personal PR firm is your black friend. You say, hey, what do you think about this tweet? Is this good? Right. And, and <laughs> then you post it. And so, but you, you haven't actually done the work of looking at your own heart and your own mind and saying, is there something in me? that might have this wrong. And I think that that is the difference between responding to crisis and responding to the conviction right. uh, of the Holy Spirit. So I think the question becomes, how do I get conviction if I haven't had it other than asking God for it? Um, I think, and I'm, I'm just gonna throw this out there, uh, like the fastest way to getting conviction for something Mm -hmm. So let's say racial reconciliation right now and injustice is something we are so unwilling to do, which is to feel pain and mourn with those who mourn, right. um, which is what Jesus called us to do. Right. When there's pain, when your brothers and sisters are feeling pain, like you feel it with them in the same way that you celebrate with right. them when there's something to be celebrated. Um, it's kind of like when, you're, when your body's hemorrhaging. Right all the blood first has to rush to that hemorrhage and feel it before right. it can start healing it, right? right. And I, so uh, last weekend, I was at the, uh, the Austin Peaceful Protest in March, and it was, it was an incredible, incredible, very humbling yep. experience. And Mike Ramos's mom got up and spoke, and, mm -hmm. and Mike was, was shot and killed, I believe, back in April with his hands up in the air and there's still not been justice for that and she yeah. just starts crying starts like obviously and I, oh. I I just realized I was like let yourself just actually feel pain mm -hmm. and feel broken and mourn with those who mourn because there, there there's centuries of ancestral trauma and present pain that needs to be felt and that's exactly what Jesus would do and I just, I'm, I'm trying to understand, um, and I talked to a lot, of, a lot of my white friends about this, what the resistance is towards just acknowledging that pain is real and it's there and right. feeling it and mourning it before throwing out all the yeah buts, like, yeah, but all lives matter. Well, yeah, yeah, but mm -hmm. most policemen are good. Okay, yeah. Right. You know, like, but... Why not just feel the pain? Because there's pain to be felt. Why are we more concerned about, let's say, problems? Like rioting's bad. Yeah. But why are we more concerned about that than the, the cause and the reason for the rioting? There's pain 
that is causing that. I want to yeah. know what that is and just and go there and feel it and say, I, I can't experience it. Right. But I can have like the same way you do, but I can try and I can have empathy and I can let you know I see you, I hear you, I feel you, and I'm with you. And there are two cries in our nation, I believe, right mm -hmm. now, one for peace and one for justice, and both of those resonate with the heart of God. Yeah. But I think a lot of us are like, let's get back to peace, or at least this peace that was there before. And, and I, I feel like God's trying to resist us and keep us from yeah. going back. He's saying, hey, peace is supposed to have a divine dance partner called justice. Mm -hmm. When those two things divinely dance with each other, yeah. man, that is, that's peace worth having and that's beautiful. But I feel like reconciliation has an order. Yeah. And the, like the first step is just feeling the pain with people. Mm. Before, like, ask my wife, I'm Mr. Fix-It. And I just want to, like, she'll, she'll come to me and just say, like, I'm hurting for this reason, this, that. I can just be in tears. And I immediately go, oh, it's because of A, B, and C. And if you do one, two, and three, it'll fix it. Right. And that never works. It yeah. never works. And she's just like, I, I want you, I want to just feel heard. Mm. I want to know that you know that I'm in pain right now. Like, right. we'll get to problem solving, but reconciliation has an order. Yeah. Um, and and I, I just feel a resistance from a lot of the white community just to feel the pain mm -hmm. because we want to throw out the yeah buts. For right. instance, rioting. And I wanted to ask you, yeah. um, in order to just help that, can you explain, can you explain rioting a little bit? And, and I know MLK has that quote where he said, I don't condone it, but I understand it. Yeah. I feel like I've had that journey in the last just three weeks where three weeks ago I didn't <clears throat> condone it or understand it. But now I can, I can yeah. genuinely say what MLK said. Yeah. I, I understand it, the pain. Yeah. So can you, can you unpack that? Yeah. You know, um, I think for um, the black community is fed up. Yeah. Um, I think I, I wouldn't say all black people are angry. Um, right now, um, I, I would say the majority of black people are exhausted. That, that's the word across the board. Um, even if you're numb, even if you're desensitized to the videos that you see, uh, I, don't, I think there's been two or three new hashtags since George Floyd. It's just exhausting. It's, it's exhausting to keep up with. It's exhausting to make the sign, to stand, to protest. It's, it's just, it's, it's just um, exhausting. And um, this generation's a little bit different. It's a, it's a lot younger people that are rioting um, that are saying, our voice is going to be heard. We're, we're actually not going to put up with this. We're not just going to uh, do what we're told. We're not just going to just take it and say, well, this is just the way that it is, which was really, um, I feel a little bit more connected to the older generation of just like, well, it's just the way that it is, so just deal with it. You know, no, a lot of people are like, actually, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and I admire it. I do. Um, I think we should peacefully protest. Um, but I understand why. Uh, people would destroy a target. <laughs> um, I feel like I have a looting personality. Like, I feel like if, if I was not a Christ follower, I would be looting the Nike store. And uh, it would not be the dollar store. I saw a dollar store on fire, and I thought, why? Why? why why'd you do that? That was that was a waste of your There's time. There's a Foot Locker you, right you, next door. You could have hit yeah. Gucci, Nordstrom, Macy's, <laughs> Bloomingdale's. There's many other options. Let's be smart about this. You know? And, you know? Yeah, my brother was like, man, I didn't I didn't get the the ticket to get the Jordans on Saturday morning. I said, if you'd have played your cards right, you could have got them Friday night. But um, he could have looted. But, um, man, I... I the, the pain that um, that a lot of African Americans feel that don't wear glasses, um, they are tired of that. Um, they are tired of fearing for their life for a speeding ticket. You know what? Like, you know, I, I've watched the George Floyd George Floyd video twice. I was more confused than angry. 
I'm, I'm thinking, he must have shot a police officer. I'm, I'm, he, he, he had to have murdered somebody, robbed a bank. So like, he, he had to do some crazy crime. You know, it's like counterfeit $20 bill. You're like, huh? Like, I'm, I'm just in, in to, to execute him on the, on the pavement. I, I just, I, I couldn't understand it. Like, I, some, some of the other police brutalities, like, I actually understand the intellect. I think it was wrong, but I understand how they got to that conclusion, like, like logically, okay? Like, okay, you shouldn't have thought Ahmaud Arbery was a threat, but in your mind, he was. And so it led to an altercation, and it was, it was fast. It was, a, a, in a life or death situation, you know, I think the whole video is, what, 27 seconds? Like, it's not very long. When I first clicked on this video, I'm like, what am I going to watch for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I, I don't understand what can happen in that long of a time. Eight minutes and 46 seconds in a life or death situation is an eternity. It, it is an eternity to at least check a man's pulse. And I think, you know, um, not just the black community, I think our world is, is woken up and saying, you know, we're, we're not going to be the generation that lets that slide. And so um, if, you know, I, I don't think people ch trust the justice system. I don't think that's just a black people thing. I think, I think all of us go a little bit like, depends on what kind of lawyer you got. We'll, we'll determine the level of, of justice. If you have more money, there is going to be a better outcome for you statistically. If you don't, you're screwed. So black, white, it, 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 it can sometimes come down to economics. And so I think everyone's looking at the situation going, while we respect police officers and the justice system uh, from a distance, there's a little bit in us that's going, no, we really got to get this one right. And so I, 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 understand, I understand it. I encourage people. I mean, I, I have friends who were at some dangerous protests that I was getting out of the streets in Dallas. You know, I said, hey, I don't, I don't want to do your memorial service this week. Can you please go home? <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're making me nervous. Um, I think we've, we, we also have to think of what's after a protest. What else can we do after we've walked the streets, after we've marched, after we've, we've taken a stand. Um, I have a rule with our leadership team. Uh, you can't complain without contributing. If you're going to complain, you must contrib contribute. So uh, actually the other day, and, and, and this was the rule that I made, <laughs> I went to our executive pastor in Dallas and I said, hey, we got a problem and I wanted to bring it to your attention. And she goes, so what solutions do you have for that? And I went, nice. Way, way, way to throw it back on me. I see what you did there. Okay, good leader, huh? Okay. But it, was, it challenged me to go, no, I can't, I can't bring a problem without also searching for a, a solution. And so it just challenged me as a person. So I think um, however we make our voices heard, um, I think we also have to help each other to go, all right, how are we going to move forward? What, what can be done? To, to move the ball forward. So what would you say a great leader would do right now? Mm -hmm. Because after um, Brenda Ramos spoke, this other guy, I don't remember his name. I wish I knew his name. I'm going to find out. But he, it was a different yeah. speech than the one she gave. Right. And uh, he addressed all the white people there. And uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't very nice. And I actually... I was like, okay, this is, I, 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 like something in my soul is loving this right now. It's mm -hmm. kind of like when you sit in a sermon and it's like, it's tough truth. Mm -hmm. Your flesh is offended, but your soul's craving it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And right. I, I felt that. I felt that. And, uh, and he said, um, and he, he was fiery, like MLK fiery, I feel like. And by the way, I heard another Dallas right. pastor, Matt Chandler, he made the point. We, we <laughs> quote Martin Luther King all the time right. because he's dead. 
Right. And he's not here to offend us right. and get in our faces. Yeah. That's what Jesus meant when he said yeah. a prophet in his hometown is without honor. 100%. And you guys love the prophets of old because they're not here to disturb your peace right now. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And this yeah. guy did that. Like he got in our faces and it was humbling and so good and so rich. But he said, he said, white people, if this is going to work, you got to say something. Mm. You got to say something. And I'm trying to figure out what to say. I want to respond to a conviction more than a crisis. Not that I shouldn't respond to a crisis, but I want it to be my conviction. And, uh, and I saw another Instagram post recently that said, and it was addressing the white community, and it said, hey, there's a time to start a movement, and then there's a time to join one. Mm -hmm. um, and when you've been sitting on the sidelines for so long, now might not be the right time to start a movement when there is one happening. So what, how can you find your place in it and support and use your voice? And I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah. And we're a predominantly white church, and I don't feel guilty for that. I love our people. Um, but I also see uh, um, uh, all kinds of backgrounds and stories and colors in this room with the one common den denominator of the cross yeah. and trying to figure out how do we get there. And I think that question just comes back to what would a great leader do? Like this week, yeah. what would a great leader do? Um, I, I think we, we have to realize as leaders, um, the world is not okay right now, which means people are not okay. And I had a leader reach out to me this week and say, should I call all the black people on our team and check in with them? I said, no. I think you should call everybody on your team and check in with them and ask every single one of them how they're processing it. White, black, Hispanic, it doesn't matter because everyone is processing this completely different and you just never know who you're going to be on the phone with. Um, I reached out to a black guy in our church who has three black sons and I said, I said these words. I said, hey, I don't, I don't know what it's like to be you and I, I can't imagine the conversations you're having with your son that I'm not having. So I can't put all black people in the same category. Um, I've got to make space for the individual story and how they are processing it. I reached out to a, a friend of mine who is from India and I said, hey, how are you processing this week? And he was like, man, you're the first one to ask. It's been so rough. The conversations I'm trying to have with my son who are brown and uh, how we're profiled at the airport. It's like we don't, we don't get a space in this conversation. It's like white and black people, there's this war, and then the Hispanics are just like, uh, well, we still got issues too. I mean, like there's not like, and so I think as leaders, we've got to be the adults in the room that says, man, let's, let's make sure everyone is heard. And uh, in a society where um, there is a massive competition going on as we speak, on social media of people trying to get their voice heard. Um, I think as leaders, we've gotta be the greatest listeners in the room. Uh, I think we've got to uh, be uh, slow to post and quick to listen. And I think that's the best thing that we can do right now is to, um, when listening, someone might say something that offends you and you will be quick to defend yourself. And so if a black person says something about white people, it's like, as soon as you hear that, it's like, oh, well, let's correct that. Ah, whoa, 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 that's not everybody. It's not all the police. It's not, it's, and, and as, you, as you talked about, like, part of reconciliation is feeling the pain first. Let them finish their story. Like, do you have to correct them right now? Um, one of my clients I was on the phone with yesterday and she said, hey, I'm, uh, I'm taking a bunch of my black friends out tonight. And w what shouldn't I do? What should I do? Like, kind of give me some, some notes before, before, before that meal. And I just said, you know, be a student, not an expert. You know, and, and she, she's a woman in business. And I said, if, if you were talking about being a woman in business and you started talking about how males have treat, treated you over the years, if I interrupted you and said, well, come on, it's, that's not all males now. Come on, come on, come on. No, that's the, how would that make you, you'd be going, you're not a woman in business. How would you know? 
you don't know what it's like to, to feel like that. That would be silly. I said, so just let them talk. And in the moment when you feel like you, you need to adjust <laughs> their perspective, don't. In fact, lean in. Hey, why do you feel that way about the police? And when you hear why that person feels that way about the police, you will hear a story. And in, um, I, love, um, I love what what we see in the life of Jesus when he hears about Lazarus dying. You would think that Lazarus, being one of the people in Scripture that are, is closest to Jesus, that them saying, hey, Jesus, Lazarus died. You would think that would make him cry. It didn't. In fact, he was rather stoic, a little too chill, eerie, you know, like, I'm good. Like, we'll go when we go. You know, it's like very, but Scripture says when he saw her weeping, when he saw Mary and Martha weeping over there, all of a sudden their, their pain became his. It wasn't like he just found out Lazarus died. It wasn't like he got to the funeral and was like, what? Lazarus is really dead? Oh, like, no. Like he saw something happening in them. And what I love about that scripture is there was proximity. He was far away. But as he got closer, he saw their pain and it, it became his, even though he knew a funeral was going to turn into a birthday party. So even though he, he was in that space and he had the power to do something about it, if you and I showed up to a funeral and we knew that we, we were going to raise a guy from the dead, we'd be in a good mood the whole time. Like, we'd be encouraging people, man, come on, what's your favorite story about that? Like, we'd be so happy because we knew how it was going to end. But Jesus is like, no, somebody's on the front row and they lost their brother. So I'm not going to miss the moment, even if I have a solution, even if I have a right hook, even if I already have a black friend, even if I already say, oh, I'm doing the work of diversity. I, my, I married this black person. I, I adopted this black. No, no, no. You're, you're still in the story because someone on the front row lost George Floyd. And a mom lost a son. I mean, a daughter lost her dad. And... Some people are going, yeah, he changed the world. It's like, man, before we get there, we, we, we have to see someone else weeping first. And um, there, there are so, um, there is this rhetoric that can kind of go around that says, well, let's wait for all the facts to come out. Well, the fact remains, somebody's weeping. So that's a fact I just can't get over that I, I, don't, I don't want to look past someone's weeping, waiting for facts to come out of fake news, real news. We, we can't decipher it well in the society that we live in anyways. And so um, I'm not for overreacting, but I'm all about empathy, as, especially as leaders, uh, as Christians. And I think, I think Christians should be leading this, whether they think of themselves as a manager, a leader, whether they are in power at an organization. I think as Christians, we should lead the way in this and just going, man, I hope that I am uh, more of a student in this than an expert. That I had a Zoom call with nine to 10 young African-Americans the other day. And I just asked them all, how are you processing this? And, and I didn't, I, I, what, this wasn't my me too moment. Yeah, me too, man, I feel it, no. No, this is, this is yours. This is, this is your story, and I'm just, I'm here to, to, to hear you out as a, as a leader. The other question I asked them was, what do you want? What, 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 what do you want in this season? One said, I want an apology. I said, from who? He said, from all white people. I go, how are you going to measure that? I mean, they all supposed to sign a petition <laughs> that says, I'm sorry, and email you? Is the thing that you want not even possible? What do you really want? And we, we started digging a little bit of just going, okay, what, what's, what's really going to help us move forward? And so I, I think we, we've got to insert um, our, ourselves into people's lives in the sense of going, man, I, I'm, just, I'm just here to be a friend. You might be white, you might be black. I have, uh, I went to school in Minneapolis I called every white pastor friend I have in Minneapolis over the past two weeks, and I just said, how you doing? Your city's on fire. Because you're not black, I'm not supposed to call you and ask you how you're doing? That's ridiculous. <laughs> like, like nobody else is allowed to be hurting or struggling or not knowing what to do next. 
Call everybody. Who in the world can say, I'm good right now? I think there is a disrupting of our peace that is good for us. Some things are being shaken that need to be shaken. And I think everyone's processing it a little bit different. And so um, I, I, I don't know anybody that doesn't need someone in their life that is empathetic to just say, hey, how, how are you really doing? That's really good. And that's interesting when you say uh, disrupting of peace. I think when a lot of us say, I want, I want peace again, what we really mean sometimes is I want comfort again. Yeah. Um, I want to feel comfort. And that's human for all of us to want that. Um, what's interesting, though, I was reading Jesus in Matthew 5 yesterday where he yeah. said, blessed are those who mourn because those who mourn will be comforted. Yeah. It's actually what you're, you're craving all along is found in that direction of entering in. And you said something yeah. about proximity to people. I've heard it said proximity creates passion. Distance creates distortion. Mm. I don't know. Chad, Chad quotes, whoever said this all the time, people are hard to hate up close, so move in. Yeah. Right? For sure. Enter into it. and Because I, yeah. I think that, that breeds conviction also in yeah. our hearts in a great way. And so can I ask you yeah. what... What you asked those guys on your Zoom call, how are you? Are, I, I, you threw out the word exhausted. Yeah. Are you hopeful and exhausted? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, I, I want to know. Like, sure. that's fine. I, but yeah, how, how are you? <clears throat> I am exhausted. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Um, I am, it's, it's weird. There is a, I am energetically exhausted. And there is something about, um, call me crazy, but I think this is the greatest opportunity Christians have ever seen in their life. It's time to wake up, man. It's time to rise up. You know, this is, it's all hands on deck. We need everybody, you know, um, bring it on. You know, we were made for this. We were born for this. We're just getting started. You know, like I just, there's something yeah. about it. Like, you know, I've, I've been, I play, you know, competitive basketball my whole life and I'm, I'm a very competitive person. And so uh, the bigger the challenge, the more I wake up a little bit. And so um, I'm tired. It feels like game seven, but I'm just like, let's go. You know, it's like we, we were, we were made for this. And I was, I was speaking, uh, so and um, four, four years ago, in response to a lot of police brutality, remember the uh, police officers were shot in Dallas, right? So that changed the game for a, a Dallasite. And I really started to feel in Dallas, the white versus black thing. Like, because this, this was the first time there was like retaliation and it was like a national thing. And, and so I was like, man, this is, this, this, is, this is getting weird. So I spoke at one of the largest white churches. <laughs> in Dallas, like the weekend after, right? And the Thursday before, I came to Red Rocks. Okay, I don't know if you remember this. And a Daisy says, we're doing a panel, just like this, right? Oh, I remember that, okay, yeah. she, And she says, my biggest fear is, or, or something along those lines, I don't want to misquote her, but she says, my biggest fear is that um, a crazy white person will come and shoot me because they don't like having a black worship leader at their church in Denver. You know, people are crazy. Yeah. And I was, and I remember saying it, I was like, really? Like you really feel like, I was like, I don't, I don't feel that. And then I was speaking to this very large white church and, and, and off of the heels of this, of the shooting of the retaliation where it's like the tensions there. And I, I promise you, I probably had two minutes to go in the message. All of a sudden, I see two white people running in the back. Okay, this place seats 4,000, right? I just see somebody pew, dart off. Now, I grew up in the hood, so like if something sudden happens, I just kind of take off and run and ask questions later. You know what I'm saying? And come <laughs> yeah. back like, hey, is everybody good? Is everybody, what, what happened? I heard a noise. And so I literally stopped talking. <laughs> and right. I was like, did they just take the shooter down? Like, I, it, uh, my mm -hmm. first thoughts were what a Daisy had said. And I was like, I wasn't afraid. And then all of a sudden, I was afraid. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, and the pastor was gone. Like, I was truly a guest speaker. There was no host. There was no one like, hey, yeah. give it up for Ryan. It was just like, I just had to get up there and be my own host, all that. And 
I was so scared, and I was just like, all right, all right, everybody, like, and literally 4,000 people, look, look this direction. And I was like, all right, everybody back up here. And I just prayed and closed my message at, at the same time. And afterwards, this, this, old, this old white lady comes up to me. She's like, oh, my goodness. I was like, what, what's going on? She goes, somebody had a heart attack back there in the middle of service. I'm like, was it something I said? I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I thought it was a shooter. They're like, no, it wasn't a shooter. And this lady, she's like, we were so scared for you. I go, you were scared for me. I was scared for me. And she was like, no, I didn't know what you were going to say. You're so young. And how are you going to handle, you know, like, well, I didn't know what to do. I was so scared for you. I was like, you know, you know, we made it through. She was like, she said, but then the Lord spoke to me about you. I go, what did he say? <laughs> she says, the Lord told me. <laughs> this ain't funny. I don't know how y'all laugh. It's not funny, okay? It's actually pretty cool, okay? She said, the Lord told me I've prepared him. I've prepared him for things he hasn't even experienced yet. In the dark when no one was looking, I've prepared him. So while I'm exhausted, I feel prepared. Every phone call I get, things come out of my mouth that I've never thought in my life. I truly feel the wisdom of God flow through me in moments that make absolutely no sense. I'm like, I don't even, I don't even know. I believe that. Where does that come from? But I, I, I feel more than prepared. I feel like my experiences growing up with black people and white people, I feel more than prepared to, to be, a, to, to be a, a bridge builder. I'm not an expert on diversity and inclusion. I'm not an expert on racism. I, I'm, that, that, that really isn't my, I don't have a PhD in some of those things. And there are people that have dedicated their lives to doing that work. But what I can do is be a bridge builder um, between not just white and black people, but people. And I'm, I'm grateful to God every day that I get an opportunity to grab a mic every now and then. I, um, this is message number 12 in the last week. And yeah, it's exhausting, but I, man, dude, I wake up and think, what an opportunity. Who else? I, I, feel, I feel prepared for the season. And so um, everyone keeps saying 2020 is the worst year of their life. And I just keep telling people 2020 isn't over. And we have seen what our God can do in three days to change the world. Man, we give him six months, we could flip the world upside down. So for me, I'm like, come on, let's go. Yeah. Man, that's so good, man. Uh, that warms my heart. So thank you. And thank you for being here just to be a bridge builder yeah. and using your voice. And somebody gave you access. And yeah. that's all you seem to do for other people Try. also is just give access and give access. And, yeah. and thank you for helping us understand a little bit more. Sure. You know, I, I've... I've been nervous for this, um, <laughs> not because of what I'm going to say or anything like that. Sure. And I know you'll, you'll take any question I throw at you and yeah. just, it's like teeing up and you'll just drive it right on the fairway. Um, but because of this sense that understand, like racism, understanding it is my problem, not yours. At least that's how I feel sometimes, and yet you're here helping me understand it. Sure. You know what I mean? Um, and building bridges and tearing down barriers. Yeah. And the humility that goes into that. Yeah. Um, and humility does not come without paying for it. Yeah. You know, and being willing to, to be broken and feel pain, and yet yeah. stand back up and get out of bed with a smile and think that 2020 still has the capacity to be the best year ever you yeah. know that so thank you yeah. i love your substance your gift your voice yeah i appreciate you man and your yeah your willingness yeah and i, I believe with all my heart god's going to continue to use you yeah even more than he already has and i'm lucky to know you yeah i'm better because of the conversations that we have had yeah and so I, uh, I wanted just to give you an opportunity if there's anything else that you want to say or yeah. minister to our church. 
yeah. please do. But then would you pray for us Absolutely. as a church? Would you yeah. pray um, for people who want to do something and want to lead and they don't know what their next steps are and um, people who still don't see this yet? Pray for that too. Pray yeah. for soft hearts and yeah. open ears and to see what Jesus saw. Because yeah. he walks out of these four walls and he sees something completely different than what we see. And yeah. the more we get to know him, the more we start to see like that. Would you, would you pray for, yeah. for that for our church? Yeah. Man, I, I think, you know, last thought is uh, Dr. Tony Evans, he said this last week. He said, oneness does not mean sameness. Oneness does not mean sameness. In other words, for us to be unified, we actually don't have to think the same. And I think what that does is it frees people up to going, you mean I can be friends with you and disagree with you at the same time? Yes, you can. My brother um, has been fighting social justice for the past few years, and we disagree all the time, almost every day. He's my best friend. We talk five times a day. At 1 o'clock, we disagree on race. 2.15, we're talking about the NBA. You know, I, I don't need him to agree with me for me to love him. And I think some of us feel like if we're going to be friends with this person that votes differently than us, we're giving up something. Yeah, you are. It's called your pride. Let it go. You know, Let, yes, you are going to give up something. Some of us are just allergic to looking bad and allergic to being uncomfortable. And I think for this to happen, for us to be unified, yeah, we're, we're going to have to sit with some people and, and uh, eat some humble pie and go, man, I... I Man, I actually disagree with that, but you know what? I don't, I don't need us to agree to love. And if that's the case, how many, how many married couples would stay married? <laughs> they disagree all the time, and yet they go, but we're going to work this thing out. And the ones that do make it the long haul have made a decision. I'm not going anywhere. And I think we have to do the same with this conversation, is to say, you know what, when it's easy, when it's not trending anymore, when we move on to a new hashtag, and when the NBA comes back and the NFL starts and somebody else says something else crazy in the election year and there's a, a million other things to distract us to stay to be willing to stay in a conversation to say you know what while we are while it's easy to move back into whatever is trending I'm going to be willing to to stay committed to being empathetic and feeling people's pain even when it's not popular so that's my hope and prayer for for Red Rock Lord I thank you so much for this amazing church the work that you are doing um, all across this country through, through this ministry, um, Lord, I pray that you would help us see the world through your eyes. Help us to be humble. Help us to be students of, of your creation. Um, I pray, God, that we would walk in humility with one another. Um, I, I pray, God, that we would be willing to sit with people that think differently than us, believe differently than us. Uh, may we learn so much from them as to how we can show your love to the world around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, bro. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. I want to hug you so bad, but I can't. I know, man. <laughs> the next time I'm here, I'm hugging everybody. Please do. You know. We'll come back anytime. Yeah. For real.